I'm Brian Jones, and I like to think of myself as a scientist, teacher, and since retirement, a wildlife protector. I was head of the Clinical Immunology Diagnostic Laboratory at Queen Mary Hospital in Hong Kong for 30 years, and taught immunology to Hong Kong U medical students. Since returning to UK, I've been looking into government policy on badger culling as a means of controlling bovine tuberculosis, and I've put together these 44 slides to share what I've discovered. Since 2013, more than 100,000 badgers have been killed, often inhumanely and at great cost to farmers and taxpayers, without achieving any reduction in bovine TB prevalence. The policy is a disaster for badgers and farmers. Bovine tuberculosis is a devastating disease, feared by all cattle farmers, not only for the loss of income, but also because of the distress of having to slaughter affected animals. Each herd breakdown has been estimated to cost on average £34,000, almost 60% of which comes from taxpayers. At least £500 million has been spent on the disease in the last 10 years. Bovine TB is caused by Mycobacterium bovis. Like the other disease-causing mycobacteria, including M. tuberculosis in humans, it is a very difficult organism for the immune system to deal with because it remains hidden within cells and, is, and it is difficult to treat with antibiotics because of its thick, waxy cell wall. It can survive for lengthy periods in the environment and it is transmitted really effectively by farmyard slurry spread onto fields. Earthworms, a staple of badger diet, and amoebae can carry M. bovis, where it remains viable for long periods. M. bovis can infect most mammals, including humans and farm, domestic and wild species. However, it is only badgers that are singled out by farmers and blamed for spreading TB to cows. By far the most important means of transmission is by the respiratory route between animals sufficiently close to each other to inhale each other's breath. It can also be transmitted by ingestion and by contact with body fluids with wounds uh, with contact of body fluids with wounds in the skin. TB is spread mainly amongst crowded communities such as cattle intensively farmed indoors. Uncooked meat from diseased fallen cattle was probably the cause of foxhounds from the Kimblewick hunt becoming infected in 2018, though they could also have picked up M. bovis when running through fields treated with contaminated slurry. Tractors and field equipment, and the humans working in or walking through treated fields, can also spread organisms found in slurry. TB in humans was a serious problem before routine pasteurisation of cow's milk, and newborn calves can be infected by the unpasteurised milk, especially as milk from many mothers is often pulled for feed feeding calves. This is what M. bovis can do in infected tissues. Tuberculous granulomas containing walled-off bacteria can occur in various organs, especially the lungs, where air sacs become hardened and inefficient at transferring oxygen to the blood. Now we come on to the diagnosis of BTB. The test that has been routinely used since the 1940s is the Single Intradermal Comparative Cervical Tuberculin, or SIPT, test. A small amount of purified protein from M. bovis is injected beneath the skin in the neck, and a similar injection of a different mycobacterium, M. avis, is injected at a separate site. If the animal is infected, a small raised lump should develop after 48 to 72 hours at the M. bovis site due to a cellular immune response, and the test is positive if the diameter measured with calipers is at least 4 millimetres and there is no response to the control M. avis injection. However, the sixth test is not very good. Although it is highly specific and there are very few false positives, its sensitivity is only between 50 and 80%, so up to half of all positive animals can be missed. It could be made more sensitive by using a 2 instead of 4 mm cutoff, or as in Europe, omitting the M. avis control. DEFRA seems more intent on minimising false positives, 
which would lead to more slaughter and more compensation payments to farmers, than removing all the infected animals from the herd. If a herd has no sick positive reactors, it is declared officially TB free and can be traded around the country. Cattle should be retested before and after moving from a high risk area, such as southwest England, to a low risk area. However, SICT inadequacy means that very often OTF herds harbour M. bovis, and 38% of herds certified as OTF at the resolving of a breakdown experience a recurrent incident within 24 months. Of course, this is blamed on badgers rather than the inadequacy of testing. In the last couple of years, enhanced diagnostic testing has been applied in certain situations, leading to an improved detection rate. The gamma interferon ELISA test can measure tiny amounts of an immunological mediator produced when immune cells are cultured with specific antigen, in this case N. bovis protein. It is much more sensitive than SICT and gives far fewer false negatives, though slightly more false positives, which farmers and government of course don't like because that means more slaughter. The gamma test becomes positive slightly earlier in the course of an infection than the SICT test, but both tests become negative in advanced disease as the bacterial load and tissue damage increase and the cellular immune system becomes non-responsive. Antibodies against M. bovis develop later than the cellular response, but remain in the circulation even in advanced disease. Antibodies can be measured in serum using the Enfaplex test, which is another ELISA. Different fragments of M. bovis protein are attached to a membrane and test serum is layered on top. If antibody is present, it will bind to the protein and this can be identified with a fluorescent dye which binds to the antibody, so the positive wells fluoresce yellow. The test sensitivity and specificity can be varied by changing the cutoff level of the of the fluorescent signal. A negative control well without embovis is always included. SICT and gamma interferon tests measure immune reactivity developing after infection with embovis, but recently it, ha it has become possible to identify embovis itself in blood or milk using activage or in excretions or the environment using the quantitative polymerase chain reaction. Both are highly specific and sensitive, and if DEFRA would agree to use them, it would be possible to identify with a high degree of certainty all infected animals. This is how Actifage works. It was invented by Ben Swift in Kath Reese's group at Nottingham University and developed commercially by PBD Biotech. It uses a particular bacteriophage virus called D29 which specifically infects mycobacteria. When this cell enters cells infected with M. bovis, the bacterial DNA is released and can be probed with a primer specific for M. bovis and the product identified by PCR. This is a rapid and very sensitive and specific test. Actifage was used along with other measures by vet Dick Sibley on chronically infected Gapcom Farm in South Devon. BTB was cleared from the herd and has not returned. This successful pilot trial is now being slowly rolled out to other areas. Incidentally, Gapcom Farm raises a permanent outdoor beef herd as well as the indoor dairy cattle. And although there are many badger clans in close proximity to the beef cattle, it is only the indoor cattle um, that have ever tested positive for M. bovis. Now we come on to the badger side of the story. Badgers have been persecuted for hundreds of years, and I would thoroughly recommend Richard Mayer's very readable and informative Fate of the Badger, recently updated from the 1956 original text, for much more information on this. Badgers are, or should be, protected by the 1992 Act of Parliament, but Natural England, presumably on instruction from DEFRA, who themselves appear to be under the thrall of the National Farmers Union, can issue licenses to cull badgers at certain times of the year for the purpose of preventing the spread of disease. 
Most ecologists and scientists believe DEFRA are wrong to make badger culling part of their 25-year BTB eradication strategy, when very clearly the problem lies within the herd. Certainly badgers should not be singled out when many other wild species carry M. bovis, and the few badgers, around 6% from roadkill studies, that carry M. bovis remain mostly healthy and non-infectious due to strong immunity which controls the infection. Furthermore, research by Rosie Woodruff at the Zoological Society of London has shown that badgers very rarely come into close contact with cattle, so the respiratory route of cross-infection is very unlikely to occur. The 17Z strain of M. bovis, previously found only in Northern Ireland, came into England with cattle imported into Cumbria in 2014, and only after that was this strain found in badgers. This proves that cattle transmit M. bovis to badgers, probably in dung or slurry via the earthworm diet of badgers. That it would take 500 badgers to produce as much faecal material as one cow makes it pretty obvious that cows are a bigger problem than badgers, who anyway use very discreet and tidy latrines for their toilet needs. DEFRA's badger killing policy is based almost entirely on the discredited randomised badger culling trial run between 1998 and 2005. Researchers were not blinded from the analysis. They knew which were control and which were test zones and so could also have been influenced to skew results in favour of the hypothesis being tested that culling would reduce BTB. Also, cattle disease was mainly determined by presence of lesions at autopsy, which would not identify mildly infected, though infectious, animals. Ten areas of England, mainly in the high TB instance areas of the South West and the Welsh borders, were selected for study. Each area was divided into three 100 square kilometre zones. One of the zones was control, no culling, and one was for reactive culling just around farms with BTB. The third proactive area was for killing a target of 70% of all badgers in the area. As an illustration of how poorly planned this study was, Natural England had not determined the number of badgers present before culling. The results showed 16% reduction in numbers of breakdown in proactive compared to survey-only areas. But this was not significant because four of the ten proactive zones showed increased incidence or no change. There were large increases in breakdowns in zones where badgers were killed only around infected farms and in the buffer zones. So the RBCT basically showed that culling was ineffective and the independent scientific group advised the then Secretary of State David Miliband that culling would not be useful in controlling bovine TB. This advice was accepted by the Labour government. In 2010, the Conservatives came into power and it didn't take them long to disband the Independent Scientific Committee, cherry-pick the 16% reduction in breakdowns and start planning to cull badgers. The first so-called pilot uh, culls in Gloucestershire and Somerset were to determine whether culling was humane and effective. 70% of badgers were to be killed during a six-week period in September and October. Despite it being found to be neither humane nor effective, DEFRA decided to roll out the cull. The number of culling zones has increased year by year, until now we have 43 zones, and no doubt more to come in 2020. Once a zone has been culled for four years during the prescribed six weeks in September and October, supplementary culling licences can be applied for, which permit culling to continue for five more years between the 1st of June and the 31st of January. Natural England are now headed by Tony Jupier, uh, Juniper, who was previously Executive Director of Friends of the Earth. He seems to have given up his principles in favour of acceding to DEFRA and the NFU. Natural England grant licences for culling and set targets for the numbers of badgers to be killed. If these targets are not met, which is usually the case, 
They are adjusted downwards so that the cull can always be called successful. There are guidelines for shooters, but they are often not enforced. Cullers can use cage trapping or free shooting using peanuts as bait. Badgers are often wounded but not killed outright, especially when free shooting, and they may suffer hours of captivity in cage traps in hot sun without water, as is also the case for other wildlife that becomes trapped. Shooters are told to aim for the heart, which is not easy when firing from a distance, and gunmen do not require any qualifications apart from attending a short training course. These are the numbers of badgers killed since 2013, the numbers increasing every year as new zones are opened up. Total extinction of badgers has occurred in some places. The killing of 102,352 badgers has not resulted in any reduction of BTV prevalence. England is the only one of the home nations that does not accept the futility of badger culling. Wales has achieved the best reduction in chronic herd breakdowns and has done this by targeting the disease in cattle, not badgers. Scotland is officially BTB free and has never culled badgers. The Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland are both moving towards vaccinating badgers instead of culling. This graph shows what has been achieved in Wales largely by advising farmers on individual plans for each cattle farm, testing exclusively with gamma interferon and controlling cattle movement. Culling badgers is extremely expensive, £50 million in 2013 to 2017, an amount that could perhaps have been spent better. Some of the cost is due to the perceived need to protect shooters from the public, police employing large numbers of men, women and vehicles, and sometimes drones and even helicopters. It works out at £1,450 per badger killed, whereas to vaccinate a badger costs about £80. In my opinion, though, it would be far better to vaccinate cattle rather than badgers, the latter, of course, requiring trapping of the badgers. The excuse DEFRA and NFU give for not using BCG to vaccinate cattle is that vaccinated animals would become sick positive and could not be exported to Europe under current regulations. But this is a futile argument because so-called DIVA tests can distinguish between infected and vaccinated animals. BCG is not a perfect vaccine, but it is giving promising results in Ethiopian cattle. Studies to improve TB vaccination have been going on for some time, but in spite of promising progress, governments have not invested in further development. Some useful work on a novel vaccine is being done at Surrey University, where subunits of Envovis are used in the vaccine and different sub subunits used to skin test. Another area of research is into the genes in cattle, which might provide improved resistance to Envovis. For many years, farmers have been selectively breeding the cows that have remained free of BTB, and studies are ongoing into identification of specific disease resistance genes. Once these loci are identified, it should, with modern molecular technology, be possible to increase expression of protective genes and reduce expression of susceptibility genes. When I was still working, I was particularly interested in the effect of stress on immune function. In Hong Kong, we found that around exam time, students went down with more respiratory illnesses than usual, and this was accompanied by increased stress hormone cortisol and concomitant reduction in immune responses required to protect against infection. We also showed that these effects could be minimised by stress-relieving interventions like meditation playing sport and listening to music. There is no doubt that high-intensity modern farming is extremely stressful for cattle. The practice of removing calves from their mothers 48 hours after birth is exceptionally distressing and must have an effect on the immune system. Just improving cattle welfare could reduce susceptibility to disease, increase responsiveness to vaccination, and even increase yields of milk and meat. 
In 2018, Sir Charles Godfrey was asked by DEFRA to review the first five years of badger culling. He actually surprised us by reporting that the main transmission of M. bovis was from cattle to cattle, and that badgers had only a small involvement in BTB. He recommended improving biosecurity on farms, using better diagnostic tests, vaccinating both badgers and cattle, using electronic cattle tags to prevent fraudulent cattle movements, set up a new computer reporting program to monitor cattle testing and trading, and to replace the Animal and Plant Health Agency and Natural England with an independent farming regulator. It took until March 2020 for DEFRA to respond, and they released their reply at a time when Britain was somewhat distracted by other events flooding, coronavirus. They promised to gradually phase out badger culling, but as we know, this government's promises cannot be relied upon. Very recently, Natural England invited new badger culling license applications and has granted new supplementary licenses for culling between the 1st of June and 31st of January to the seven zones which started culling in 2016, two in Cornwall, two in Devon, and one each in Dorset, Gloucestershire and Herefordshire. DEFRA still stand by the discredited RBCT and continue to blame badgers for spreading BTB. APHA is the epidemiological research arm of DEFRA and they have published two recent papers arguing that the badger cull should be continued. The first by Lucy Brunton et al was neither randomised nor controlled but presented statistics which they argued showed some reduction in BTB incidents in the first two years of culling, that they admitted the evidence was not conclusive. Sarah Downs et al. re-ran the statistical models used by Brunton et al. and claimed that four years of culling was reducing BTB. Shamefully, they did not include figures that were available to them, showing that the following year, 2018, prevalence increased once more, especially in Gloucestershire. Even they could not pretend that their statistical methods were infallible. Veterinary surgeon Ian McGill has published a much more convincing analysis of the effects of five years of culling on BTB prevalence in Gloucestershire and Somerset, and three years in Dorset. Prevalence was decreasing before culling started, but no further improvement has incurred since. Finally, these are the summary statistics from DEFRA's own publication. BTB prevalence was very low after the mad cow disease slaughter in the 80s and 90s and foot and mouth disease in 2001, but increased very rapidly due to restocking without stringent testing for BTB. The levelling off of new BTB breakdowns happened to coincide with culling between 2013 and 2018. But there were other factors at play, such as increased regulation of cattle movement and better biosecurity. The downturn of prevalence since 2018 is claimed by DEFRA to be because culling badgers is much more because of culling badgers, but it is much more likely to be due to improved diagnostic testing using gamma interferon. In conclusion, culling badgers does not reduce bovine tuberculosis. But there is every expectation that using improved cattle testing and increased measures in cattle will. I personally don't think vaccinating badgers is necessary because I do not believe badgers are a significant reservoir of M. bovis for infecting cattle. I further believe that an effective vaccine for cattle will become available eventually if money and time is invested in development, and that should put an end to bovine TB. Thank you.